Hello guys, my name is Diego Pacheco and this is another Slidecast. Today we're gonna talk about test in production, all right? So first thing um, you must have in mind is, are you out of your mind, you're crazy? Yes, because that sounds crazy. Because often we have this idea that, you know, people who test in production are amateurs and they're not professionals, they don't have other environments, so they do that because they really don't care, all right? Um, and that could be true and false, it really, boils down to the guardrails that you have there and and that's the difference between amateurs and professionals but both uh, my test in production so let's start talking about the issues with pre-production testing right so pre-production testing is something you should do don't get me wrong right but you know th there are limits you cannot fix all the problems just with pre-production testing. Otherwise, we would be able to regulate everything. And we cannot regulate everything because there are limits, all right? Because we need to predict things. So basically, um, the principles behind pre-production testing, and pre-production testing is a fancy word for unit stress, integration tests, you know, that when you don't run in production. And the issue with that is that you need to predict all possible scenarios, all right? And and that's not true. You cannot do that. Um, you know, so have these ideas that uh, lots of QA engineers push for, um, even managers sometimes, is that you need to have 100% test coverage, right? And that's a flaw idea because, you know, test coverage tools, um, they often, um, you know, capture specific um, solutions like, say, JUnit. And if you get your unit, you are getting mostly uh, unit tests, sometimes integration tests, but you will not be getting stress tests, chaos tests, um, you know, and, and other forms of testing, all right? So the tools, they are flawed. They were not able to capture everything. And also there's waste, right? So you need to spend a lot of time ignoring things there, right? And also when you do unit tests, you know, mocks, they have cost. Mocks are the techniques who are most costly uh, there are cheaper techniques like fakes and dummies but uh, you know in, in others there's a video um, you know can look on my youtube channel or on my blog you're gonna see that i i, I go on over this but basically you know th there is waste in, in in mocks and mocks are expensive all right so um there are weights and tests and numbers doesn't mean quality right so there's no clear and generic number or distribution of tests that can work for every company or for all the services in your company, right? So people want these signals because they want a metric so they can, based on that metric, engage or not with that team, all right? But it, it doesn't work like that. And I love this quote from Dijkstra where he says that testing shows the presence, not the absence of bugs. So when you write a test, you actually proofing that you know that scenarios that you wrote it it works, but it doesn't mean that you are covering all uh, you know thirty other scenarios that you didn't wrote, right? So basically, and even writing it, uh, you know, it it again it goes on that premise that you know what you're doing and you can you know predict, and <laughs> that's not how it works. We cannot predict all possible outcomes. The the other issue is that um, you know testing in pre-production, there is a replication issue, right? We, we have this fallacy that we can replicate prod and we cannot replicate prod. Often we have inferior hardware, we don't have all the conditions and migrations that are happening in prod that it doesn't happen in pre-prod, right? So the expectation and reality in pre-prod is completely different. Lots of people hate the pre-prod environment, right? It's always uh, clanky or flaky, and that could be QA, staging, stress environment, whatever. Um, and, you know, in the end of the day, there's no place like production. That's where the things happen and is unique. That's why we need to go there and be there. So, like I said before, failure cannot really be legislated, right? Um, we need a new approach. In other words, we need a sort of a new mentality, right? So, instead of trying to predict, which is impossible, we need to have better understanding of what's going on and then be able to isolate the failure in production, right? So, some frameworks like Akka, um, you know, and, and, and some distributed um, computing tools implement this naval engineering um, pattern called bulkheading, right? So, so in a boat, they have like th these um, boxes where, you know, let's say if there's a crack uh, in, in one part, the water is going to fulfill that uh, 
compartment, it will not flood the whole boat, right? If there was not such a thing, the the, the failure, the, the water will fulfill the whole uh, boat, right? And, and this is all about isolation, right? So if you have isolation, is more safer to do in production. And don't get me wrong, if you don't test in production, you're still gonna have bugs, you're still gonna have outages, you're still gonna have problems, right? So really, um, you need you need to start changing gears and also have more diversity. And that's what matters, all right? We need to test pre-production and post-production, all right? And when I say post-production, I need to say that deploying release are a different thing, all right? So we are able to deploy in production, test the deploy, but not necessarily have impact on the user. Or if we have impact, that's kind of a controller, right, by a canary. So we're gonna reduce the blast radius, right? So this idea of the test pyramid, it's kind of a work at a long time ago for backend, but now it doesn't work anymore. Even for front end, I would argue that snapshotting and, you know, static typing like, um, in TypeScript would make more sense, right? So really, uh, the pyramid doesn't work anymore everywhere. And this idea of this spectrum where you have pre-production, production, you know, and you have more um, forms and, and testing diversity, that's really the way to go, right? So now, let's talk about the pattern landscape. We're gonna cover all these patterns here. We're gonna talk about chaos engineering, nuclear options, blue-green, uh, A-B testing, synthetic monitoring, observability, Toggles, canary, reply traffic, dark canary, and safeguard. So let's right go into it, right? So for for toggles, <clears throat> toggles are like uh, levers, right? That you switch, that you turn on and off. They are common, um, you know, and often useful for dramatic new versions. So let's say you have a social network, you have, you bring a completely different new newsfeed experience. So it's good to have a toggle to send users turn on and turn off. Lots of sites have explicit toggles where you can click, oh, I want to go back to the old UI and they, they keep that for a while, right? So the user itself can switch off. Uh, that's pretty cool. I saw that in Evernote some time ago. Um, in a nutshell, right, it's pretty much properties and ifs in the code, right? And um, so the the the, um, the toggles can be role based, right? So all users that have this uh, salesman role, you know, gonna enter in a toggle, or they could be strategy based, based on a bunch of criteria, or um, you know, all types of users or specific country. Some time ago, I heard that Facebook first released things in Brazil. I, I don't doubt that it could be really the case. Um, or people with some age or some X, Y, Z proper, right? So it can combine a bunch of things to select a specific niche of users. So they require code changes, right? So they're better than branching. Some people say that you can do that by branching, but you know, long-lived branches are a problem. Um, it's useful to use some prefix, like if you know it's a very temporary thing, uh, like the word temp in front of it, and then you might name it that, uh, both on the toggle uh, and in the branch if you're using branch. I, kind of against branch, I prefer trunk-based development. Um, some people love it, other hates, right? Because there's this abuse and technical debt that could happen. Um, but Flex should only be used with proper observability. So either you have metrics uh, or log what's going on. So you know if the tracks are being uh, accessed. And there's this interesting idea of a flag status where you know have this counter around the flags and if the flag is not um, access by you no know, seven days then the the state of the flag change to auto remove or you know it will be in a different state and you can go there and easily remove because you know that nobody's using and there is this difference between technical and non-technical flags right so ideally you want to put this in control of the business because you want to use for feature but you also want to use for technical purpose all right so say you are doing a migration you're migrating a database or you know uh, you're migrating a server or any big technological change uh, you might also want to you know have flags or toggles so that's that's our toggles the next pattern is called observability right and observability it composed by metrics traces logs dashboards and alerts but that's one way to see it the other way to see it it's something between monitoring and testing right and basically what you want to do is just simulate failure uh, modes, right? That's that's what happens. So this is a basic requirement for everything, all right? Because we need to know what's going on now. Is the services working properly? Um, one way to do this is running your tests against prod. That's a form of observability, right? And there are some maturity levels, like 
if you're just praying, you don't know what's going on, that's level one. Level two is okay, I have logs. Level three, I have dashboards, I have alerts. And ideally, you build systems that are self-healing, self-operating. If you want to look in my blog, there's a post that I call about Dynamite Manager, where I build like a sort of a self-healing, self-operating system for Cassandra cluster. So uh, take a look there. Um, and... Um, there are some levels, right, of um, observabilities. Like uh, I can have like a OS, machine, uh, metrics, like a CPU, memory, disk, network. I could have more like application metrics, like request response per second, or, or errors, or tail latency, or, or query length, or some more like infrastructure metrics, like uh, how many Kubernetes pods do I have? How is the network traffic inbound and outbound? Um, or even, which is kind of a new, but also very cool, domain observability metrics, right? So I have an e-commerce, I can say, okay, so how many sales I'm doing right now, how many logins I'm having, right? So um, that's like business level metrics. And we, we would need these things uh, to test in production, right? And I comment more when I go to the safeguards. Then the next pattern is called synthetic monitoring, right? And the idea here is simply like, this is also called semantic monitoring, or some people just call it like business monitoring, right? But the idea is like you replicate the user experience, um, you know, and that's a good way to measure latency, all right? But also to answer basic, basic question like, is the business working right now, right? Can, can I do sales? Can I do logins, right? So this is very similar to end-to-end -to -end or UI testing, right? But it's against prod and, you know, we have a proper like a metrics dashboard alert. So it, it, it marries with observability. So it might require instrumentation on the services. So like make some records invisible, right? Because you don't want to mess with the user uh, data. You want to create your own data, for instance. Now it can be done with some uh, uh, end-to-end UI tools like Selenium, Cypress, or any tool that you like. Like this is product called Pink Dome. It's pretty cool. Um, ideally, you know, should run this outside of your cloud if you want to get the latency perspective from your user. If you don't care about the latency, you just want to know if it's working on, you can run inside your cloud. Um, you know, and, and like any good test, it needs to be self-contained or you need to have proper isolation because you're going to be running against prod, right? So it needs to be well-shaped. Then the next pattern is called ABN testing. Uh, this is a form of a split testing where the user... Different users see different options. You have a control, you don't have experiment. It could be either A, B or N. It could be uh, 10, 14, uh, 20, 30 options where how many or whatever you want. So this is like testing production for the business. It's really used by all big technical companies in Silicon, uh, Silicon Valley. Um, it's a huge source of revenue turning um, from simple colors like, oh, is my button here better green or light green, all right? or picking the word, should, should you click in join now, um, you know, subscribe now, um, you know, uh, shut up and take my money, what should be the wording? Um, or it can be done with, a, you know, simple duplication, right? Like I have one page, I, I copy and paste that code, and then I have a second page, then I just how to a different page, right? So it could be easily done on the front end, but, you know, easily might require toggles in coordination with the back end. So there is one interesting use case from Bing that they have more than 30 billion possible experiments, right? So it's unlikely that uh, the same users will, be, will see the same version of the, the site, right? And that's quite interesting when you think about it, right? Because Bing is like Google, right? So, um, you know, um, th there's a paper about this. You can look on the web if you want. Um, okay, so moving next to the... Next pattern. Next pattern is about uh, blue-green deployment. So th this is a very classical pattern, right? Like where, where you have like a two pools of servers um, and then it's like a switch, right? So the reason why you do that is because it's a fast recovery, right? So you can have like, um, let's say you have four services, right? And each service has two machine. Then you can double that pool uh, for each service, right? And then easily you can hold back things, right? And, and, and this is a form of um, reducing the blast radius, right? Uh, but unfortunately, it's all or nothing, right? Either, either you send all your users to the blue 
clusters or to the green clusters. This pattern is also called um, red black, right? Or blue green is, is the same thing. Um, but this can also be used to test things uh, in production before users see. So let's say code version two is on green. I could deploy things on, on blue now, all right, to test it. Uh, the issue is I won't be able to hold back, right? But I could be isolating from the user. That's a very basic form of um, isolation. There's better techniques actually. All right, so let's move on. So the next pattern is called uh, canary or split traffic, right? And the idea here is that it's, it's exactly like blue green, but is now is not like uh, all or nothing, right? You you do that progressively. So you go like um, uh, you halt like one percent of users, five percent, ten percent, twenty five. 50, 75, 100. And in my opinion, this is the best form uh, of testing, the best of all, right? Because as real as you can get, you're really getting full-fledged production. And if something goes wrong, you know, we, we're going to talk about that on, on safeguards, but, you know, can literally affect uh, your internal users or one user or just a, a, a handful of users, all right? So it's really good for Blast Radio. Um, this can be used with a blue green as well, all right? And uh, they require some tooling. There are some tools, some of these tools I used in the past, like Spinnaker. Um, there's like a commercial uh, tool called Harness. Uh, and if you are on the, you know, Kubernetes, Istio landscape, there is uh, Flagger and Argo as well that can help you with that. The next pattern is called Chaos Engineering. Uh, Netflix is popular with the Simeon Army where they have like a, a monkey to do a, a different kinds of uh, failure. And you need to do that in production, right? Because again, you cannot legislate failure. So uh, it's, this is a form of testing that makes sure your infrastructure is anti-fragile, right? And an anti-fragile, it means um, you're not trying to freeze production of bureaucracy. You're actually, you're not trying to prevent failure. You are, you know, failure will happen. You, you want it or not. And then what happens is you prove you can recover from the failure, right? So they're based on experiments and ex uh, expectations. Netflix run this in prod for years without issues, right? And, um, you know, basically want to induce failures. And there's some ideas of things you could do, like you could tear down one, one machine, you could burn the CPU, the disk, the IO, the network, you could never return a service call, you could return all news, you could return a string bomb, a string that's for gigabyte, you could do a GC bomb, call GC like crazy, um, you could introduce uh, lagging, you know, you could lose package, you could tear down an IZ, you could tear down a region, all right? And then you can see if you have failover in place and you can test, you know, the, the fallbacks that you might have in your code. The next pattern, right, uh, is called uh, nuclear options. This was popular from Facebook, but also Netflix has a take on it in Gremlin as well. But um, the idea here is that testing production with chaos engineering meeting UX user experience. And then in Facebook, they have a story about the feature uh, where the users uh, at some point was able to change their username. Um, and then, um, you know, for that, they were really prepared and they were prepared to go nuclear, like, uh, you know, disabling features on the whole timeline, you know, and, and they have like different levels, uh, you know, they could be completely nuclear or less nuclear, right? Like disabling recommendations, disabling the chat, disabling uh, lots of things. And, and Netflix also talks about this as the user experience degradation, right? So if you cannot um, get a recommendation of a movie, let's return a list of top 10 action movies for the user, for instance, right? And then you can build this sort of a resilience matrix where you can list your components and services and you can say, okay, how they're gonna operate if there's failure, right? How, how they should be operating, should they failure or should be they partially working and degrading the user experience? And that's a very interesting idea. Uh, and, and this here, there is a, a piece of slide that I stole from Gremlin where they talk this about being like a feature, right? A way to delight your users that, you know, it's not binary, it's not, it's working or not working, right? And you have this parts of the site that might be working, parts of the site might not be working, right? So that's uh, pretty cool. And you need to in injection failure in production. Now, the next pattern is called safeguards, right? And, and this is where we separate the professionals from the amateurs, right? Basically, 
we need to have a threshold to stop. We need to know that we are creating problems and then we need to stop right now, right? And the way you can do that is have like a synthetic monitoring and alerts, right? So if you have synthetic monitoring, you can see if there's business uh, effect, or it's affecting the business, you stop right away. So it's important to make your tests self-contained, right? Because they're gonna be running in prod. You don't wanna have any zombie hack or that that could affect you, right? You, and you want to have the test like in, in a dependent way that you can run them multiple times. So observability is really the key. You need to know what's going on. So, you know, if you have like a dark pool, um, yeah, I'm gonna talk a bit more about dark canary in a moment, but um, you know, it, either you could work on this non-persist mode, which I, I personally don't like much because you're not simulating full-fledged production, right? Or ideally, you could run with a different database or even a different environment, right? But either way, we require, it requires some instrumentation. Another thing you could do is a safeguard is have like a beta users program, right? So in prod, you first release to internal users, then to your beta users, right? And then um, a canary filtering black uh, beta users might be enough, right, to to do it and, and, and might be a good safeguard. So um, if you do traffic split, right, you might want to get to one user first or your internal users pool first, right? And uh, another thing you could do is use user feature toggles, right? Because if something go wrong, is you can switch the toggle and then you go back to the old version of the feature, right? Or disabling the feature, right? So then you have a way to deal with it, right? So that are some safeguards that you could implement to make things more, um, you know, safe in order to do it in production. The next pattern is called reply traffic, right? And this is used in conjunction with dark canary. This this pattern is also known as shadowing or mirroring or death traffic testing or dark cluster testing. You know, there's different names for it. I like reply traffic or shadowing, but the idea is like you capture production traffic. So it's really about isolation. And then you reply the traffic against a new server, right? Or, or, or a dark pool of servers, right? So. Uh, in theory, there should be zero impact, right? Because no one gonna get the response back from that request that you are generating the traffic. The traffic is real, but you know uh, it will not return to the user, right? So either by uh, capturing logs or you have a distributed log solution like uh, Kafka or Kinesis, then you know you can do reply traffic in prod on the dark pool canary or even in no prod, right? But um, if you're doing non-prod, this might require some sort of uh, pseudo anonymization to, you know, move, move outside of a prod or, you know, uh, it's important to say this, this can get a bit complicated, might require uh, infrastructure. And here's is one example with an ambassador, uh, you know, you know, going there. For, for the services part, it's not that hard. It's pretty much like uh, redirecting to a different cluster. Um, databases is the harder part of it. <laughs> So the next pattern is the dark canary. So this is not a, a DC hero, to be clear. It is a DC hero, right? But I'm not talking about the DC hero. So this can be used with or without the reply traffic pattern, right? So basically it's just a set of pools. So it's similar to blue green, but you know, results are discarded in, in, and uh, they use it, you know, to, to simulate uh, stress tests in production. So you can get some load, um, like you can do a dual write traffic to to, to to active cluster and dark cluster, right? So you can get a glimpse here of a real traffic before being active. And that's a good chance to catch bugs and, and test things with a full-fledged production, right? So that's um, another interesting pattern. So here um, we see Envoy. Envoy has some features uh, that allow us to do that. And also we see a picture from LinkedIn uh, on their story about how they do this uh, dark clusters, uh, dark canary, right? Where uh, they basically have a sort of a registry and discoverability tool that can halt properly the requests, you know, to, to canary or to the real uh, cluster. LinkedIn, uh, here's the link about the article. It's pretty good, by the way, you can take a look, but also they have a formula uh, that can help you to scale 
your uh, dark cluster in regards of your cluster, right? So if you want some specific QPoS, they have a formula that can help you to get there. So you can know uh, the threshold, how many instances from the real cluster to the dark cluster to get there, right? So that's it. I hope you guys like it. See you next time. Cheers.